Remember when you approach these problems is always what's my acid, what's my base, is it strong, is it weak? And once you've figured those things out, they're not that bad. Yes, they require work. I agree with you on that. So for example, the TA, the SIs have a problem on their worksheet that goes something like this. I like this one, by the way. Okay, the question says, mix 50 milliliters of 0.5 molar HCl, okay, HCl is an acid and it's a strong acid. There's seven strong acids, Amelia, not six. You forgot HClO3. So, but that one comes up so seldom that I don't worry about it. So there's seven strong acids, HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, H2SO4, HClO4 and HClO3. Did you get all those? Somebody said, yep. There are seven strong acids and there are seven strong bases. If it's not on either of these lists, it is weak. How weak? You need to know the K value to know how weak. The smaller the K value, the weaker the compound. So the seven strong bases are all of the group one hydroxides. Remember the solubility rule for hydroxides? Yes, you gotta remember solubility rules too. All hydroxides are insoluble except group one and strontium and barium, the bottom two on the bottom of group two. Now those of you staring at your periodic table are saying, what about francium hydroxide? Yes, francium hydroxide would also be a strong base, but it's radioactive, so I'm not gonna touch it. And in the same group. And well, yeah, francium's highly reactive, so. So these are the, the 14, seven strong acids, seven strong bases. Anything else is weak. All right, so we go to this problem over here, HCl, it's a strong acid. When you put it in water, if it's strong, it breaks apart into its ions. So what's the concentration of hydrogen ions if I just had 0.5 molar HCl? 0.5, the str a strong acid, anything that's a strong acid or base completely breaks apart and gives you ions. A weak, it doesn't completely break apart. I'll get back to that. So we mix that with 30 milliliters of 0.5 molar ammonia. Ammonia, is it one of the strong bases that's over there? No, do I have to remember that it's a base? Yes. Hopefully by now you see ammonia and you think, oh, that's a base, okay? And it's not on my list of seven, so it's a weak base. So I've got a strong acid and I'm mixing it with a weak base. Acids react with bases, unless it's a conjugate acid-base pair. A conjugate acid-base pair as an aside here, <coughs> if I react ammonia with its conjugate base, or excuse me, its conjugate acid, I have a base and an acid. A base is a proton acceptor. That looks boring to me. So conjugate acid-base pairs don't react. But in general, acids and bases react together to give you acids and bases. So ammonia is gonna react with HCl. Well, guess what? They'll react together. Anytime you know all of the reactants, 
you have what kind of problem? Limiting reactant problem. So this one should be screaming at you, limiting reactant problem. I need to know the limiting reactant. Well, if it's a limiting reactant problem, then you should be saying, oh, that means I need to know moles. Let's see, I've got 50 milliliters of 0.5 molar HCl. That tells me I've got 25. Oh, is that right? Millimoles. 50 times 0.5 is 25, yes. I have 25 millimoles of HCl. And I have 15 millimoles of ammonia. What I really like about this problem, it's on the SI review sheet, is it's a curveball. At first, when you read this thing, you say, oh, this is I'm making a buffer. Remember, there's three ways to make a buffer. Yes, number one is buy it. The first question that I wrote says, you all know that you could buy a buffer. So I even told you that in the first problem. The second way is to mix equal amounts of base and conjugate acid or acid and conjugate base. And the third way is to take a weak base, like ammonia, and neutralize it with a, weak, with a strong acid, like HCl. And if you neutralize half of the weak base that you start with, you'll be left with half of your weak base, and you'll have made an equal amount of the conjugate acid. So you've made a real nice buffer. And so you look at this and you say, oh, look, we're going to make a buffer. Guess what? What's the limiting reactant? The base. So you're mixing a strong acid with a weak base. The weak base gets used up. When it gets used up, what did you make? A strong acid plus a weak base makes weak acids. Strong acid plus weak base makes weak acids. So we made a weak acid. So now when I'm all done with the limiting reactant problem, what do I still have? Strong acid, HCl, I have excess HCl, and I've got weak acid, ammonium ion. Do I have to solve an equilibrium problem? No. This is the curveball. There's no equilibrium problem to be solved here. If I mix a strong acid with a weak acid, who cares about the weak acid? It's not going to do anything. The strong acid determines the pH for me. How can you prove that to yourself? You've already done this once. There's the weak, the weak acid equilibrium. If I react these two together, I'm going to make NH4+. Plus. So if I react 25 millimoles of HCl with 15 millimoles of NH3, I'm going to make 15 millimoles of NH4+. Plus. I'm going to use up all the ammonia, and I'm going to have 10 millimoles of excess hydrogen ions. And so over here, I don't care about water. There is no ammonia left. It was the limiting reactant. It's gone. I've still got 15 millimoles of ammonia in 80 milliliters of solution. Whoops. I have 15 millimoles of ammonium. So there's the initial concentration of ammonium ion. There is no ammonia. It was the limiting reactant. And I have excess H3O plus. Let's see, H3O plus 10. Do you have to divide it by 80 milliliters? After all, I'm dividing both sides by 80. If I'm doing it to both sides, no, you don't. That's a secret, though. One of the things that I've tried to show you in doing all of these, for consistency's sake, is that when you do an equilibrium calculation, use concentration. 
When you do a limiting reactant problem, use moles. Don't mix the two. However, once you get to the point where you realize, I'm doing it to both sides, why do it? Good. You've just got to the next level. Congratulations. The kappa problems, don't worry about volume, because I know I'm going to divide by the same volume on both sides. So the computer doesn't bother to do the calculation. Do what you're comfortable with. For those of you who understood just that, right, that just now, great, do it. If you didn't, don't worry about it. Keep using concentration. It will not, well, yes, it will change what X means. So you're going to get an X in moles then, and so then to get the concentration, you've got to divide by the volume. Is it this? Well, the ratio is the same, the number's not. Stick with concentration. Or always put units on your numbers. I think I said that on day one. Anyway. Whoops. Ugh. All right. So there's my ice table. I can set up Ka. How do I know it's a Ka? Because there's a hydrogen ion as a product. There has to be a Ka. Don't worry if you can't read this. It's going to become very simple in just a second. I know I'm writing it small, but I'm about to make this so simple that you'll step back and say, why did we bother to do all that? And that's the whole point of this. Ammonium ion is a weak acid. The math trick that we've been using all along is that when K is small, we assume that X is much less than the number it's being added to or subtracted from. So we're going to do that just like before. We're going to assume that x is much less than this number. Well, as soon as I do that, that's my H plus concentration. If my goal is what is the pH, I don't have to solve this equilibrium because my pH is right there. As soon as I find out that x is small, then my hydrogen ion concentration is just that. And so if you step back and say, if I mix a strong acid with a weak base, just a second, Susie, and the weak base is the limiting reactant, you don't have to solve the equilibrium because the strong acid will determine what the pH is. This reaction won't matter. You won't get much X, and the amount you get isn't going to affect the pH. It's all determined by the strong acid that's in there. So, Susie's question is, the amount of H3O plus you get from the dissociation of ammonia is so small, it's not going to affect it. What does matter is the amount of excess HCl that I have, and that's exactly what that says, right? The other question that I've been getting a lot of lately is KF. Is the pH really, really low? 0.125? Actually, yeah, it's, it's going to be pretty low. It's like 1.3 or 0.9? Yeah. Point, yeah, it's very low. Negative Yeah, it, it's very low. Would that make sense? You've got to, never, no, I shouldn't say that. Never mind. No. The question Zane just asked is if I'd ever give you a super acid. No, I'm not going to give you a super acid. I'm not quite that mean. I try. Sometimes I try. Yes. I thought I heard. Yes. The question Susie's now asking, thank you, Susie, keep asking those questions, is what if I mix a strong base with a weak acid? Just change the identity. Make it sodium hydroxide and ammonium ion. Guess what? 
same thing. If the limiting reactant is the weak compound, you don't have to solve the equilibrium in the end. The only time you solve an equilibrium reaction is if you've got a weak acid, a weak base, a slightly soluble compound or an insoluble compound. That's the only time you have to solve an equilibrium. The only time you solve an equilibrium problem is if you have an equilibrium constant. What's the equilibrium constant for HCl? Infinite. What's the equilibrium constant for a strong base? Infinite. What's the equilibrium constant for any of those 14 things up there? Infinite. For all soluble compounds, the value of the equilibrium constant is infinity. It completely reacts, so you don't have to worry about it. So unless there's a weak compound in there, there's no equilibrium to be solved. If there's a weak acid, a weak base, a slightly soluble compound, or a complex ion, then you will have to solve it. What is the answer about 0.9? Boy, do I need new glasses. All right. Remember that when we first introduced equilibrium constants, if you go back and look at that class, and I made this whole long list of different equilibrium constants. And the point of that was just to convince you, or just to share with you, that the subscript on an equilibrium on the K is really just to lend clarity as to what kind of equilibrium constant it is, is it? We've talked about Ka's and Kb's. You all know now that if H3O plus is a product, you have to have a Ka. If OH minus is a product, you have a Kb. Ksp, solubility product. You're talking about a solid compound and its ability to break apart into ions. How soluble is it? So a solubility product what are the words? Solubility product. Oh, x times x. There's the product. So if I take an insoluble compound like silver chloride and I break it apart to silver ions and chloride ions, I get a Ksp. So the solubility products are always solid going to ions. Kf is the formation of a complex ion. And so when you look at a data table and it says, tetraiodo cadmium 2 minus ion, this thing, the Kf is equal to 2.0 times 10 to the sixth. The reaction is this one. It's the reaction to form this ion. Well, the problem with this is it's just an equilibrium. It's just like any other equilibrium problem. You solve it the same way. I need to know the initial concentrations the change that occurs, what are the equilibrium concentrations, put it in there, but now solving it gets to be a challenge because we can't use the math trick of ignoring the size of x. Why not? Look at the value of k. What does it tell you? It tells you if you mix cadmium ions with iodide ions, you're going to make cadmium iodide. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. The K value is so large, and all formation constants are so large, that if I have this and I have this, I'm going to make this. You know what? This sounds exactly like what we talked about in September. If I were to have asked you this question in September and said, mix four moles of cadmium ion with 16 moles of iodide ion, and how much cadmium iodide will you make? Everybody in this room would say, oh, four moles of cadmium will give me four moles of cadmium iodide. 16 moles of iodide will also give me four moles of cadmium iodide because of the four to one ratio. It's a limiting reactant problem. You could all do those in your head now, especially when I give you nice small numbers. But back in September, you'd have said, okay, if I mix four moles of this with 80 moles of this, oh, Let's see, four will make four, 80 will make 20. Ooh, not good. One of them's gonna run out. Which one's gonna run out? This one's gonna run out. So I'll be left with none of this 
80 minus 4 over 100 milliliters, whatever it is. So the number of moles over 100. And I had 4 millimoles of this, so I'm going to make 4 millimoles of this. That's a question from last September. You can all do that. You can still do it. It's a limiting reaction problem. But guess what? Now you know it's also an equilibrium problem. So if it's an equilibrium problem, we're going to have to solve it the way we've been solving every other equilibrium problem. So what's going to happen? Well, this is going to get used up. Wait a second, you're going backwards. No, I'm not going backwards. I don't have any of this. There's no way I can make more if I don't have any. Or I can't, excuse me, I can't use any of this up if I don't have any. But I have all of the reactants I need over here, so I can use up some of this and make some of each of these. And then I can say this is plus x, and this is 70, 0 0.76 um, plus x, and this is 0.04 minus x. Yes? Yes, it should be plus 4x. Thank you. And now I can solve this problem. Let's see. Kf equals And this is where you should start to panic. Because all of a sudden you say, wait a second, I'm going to get a fifth orbital polynomial out of this. I don't care what level calculus you're in, nobody likes to solve fifth order polynomials. I don't even think Butler likes to solve fifth order polynomials. He might. That's an interesting idea. Anyway, so how the heck am I going to solve this thing? I can't do the math trick. I have to solve a fifth order polynomial. I'm going to avoid that like the plague. Yeah, like that too. So I would make the assumption that x is small, except I can't do that, can I? Well, it is small, actually. Because if it's all going to go this way, that means it's not going to go much this way. Well, if that's the case, let's just turn it around. I turn the reaction around. When I turn the reaction around, I take the reciprocal. If I take the reciprocal of this, I take the reciprocal of this. And this is what it looks like now. I just did one over the whole thing. I'm sorry? Positive six. I've watched so many people put a negative there that I'm doing it now. Sorry. It is going to be a negative six, right? It's going to be 0.5 times 10 to the minus six, or 5 times 10 to the minus five. It's supposed to be a plus 4 again. Boy, at least I'm consistent in what I screw up. But now that I know this number is so small, I can do the math trick that says ignore x. So I'm going to ignore the 4x or the 1x, depending on how you wrote it. I'm going to ignore this x. I have to keep this one. But guess what? I don't have x to the fourth anymore. I just have 0.76 to the fourth. And yeah, I know how to do that on my calculator. So I can solve for x now. Because I can do the math trick, I don't have to solve the fifth order polynomial, and it's a piece of cake. We can solve for x. All I did was math, right? Hang on, hang on. OK. In order to do the math trick, if I, in order to ignore x, that means I need a small value for k. If I have a large value for k, I can't do it. It's not permitted. Just take that as the truth. Okay? In order to get a small value for k, I have a large one, right? I have 2 times 10 to the 6th. How do I make that a small number? Well, let's see. I just multiply it by a very large negative number. I, can't, I could do that to both sides, but that's not going to help me. Mathematically, if I just take the reciprocal, in other words, I just reverse the reaction, 
So chemically, I'm reversing the reaction. Mathematically, I'm taking the reciprocal. They do the same thing. Now my k value is very small, and I'm back to where I want to be. I want to do the math trick that says ignore x. All it does is it lets me ignore x. If you want, you can solve the fifth order polynomial. You have to do it graphically and look for the roots of it and figure out which of the five roots is reason, excuse me, six roots is reasonable and there's only going to be one that's reasonable. Can I complete it? Sure. So I get um, five times ten to the minus five, negative seven. Why do I always go the wrong way? Equals x times 0.76 to the fourth over 0.04. So x equals 6 times 10 to the negative 8, I go back up and look at my table and I say, oh look, that's the cadmium ion concentration at equilibrium. Because even though I reversed the reaction, I never changed the signs on it, did I? Because I don't have to. Reversing the reaction won't change the signs, it'll leave them exactly like they were. So the cadmium ion concentration is 6 times 10 to the minus 8. The cadmium iodide concentration is what? 0.04 minus 6 times 7 minus 8. Sounds like 0.04 to me, which makes sense. We made lots of products, so it's not going to lose much of it. And the iodide ion concentration is 0.76 plus 4 times that number. Well, that's 0.76. Could I, oh, would that be a great question? Could I determine a pH from this? Oh, wouldn't that be nasty? Mix pH with solubility. So for example, something like I know which one. K F K F P. Oh, it's this problem. Which problem is this? Cut, shut, what off? Which problem, Tanya? 74 is a strong acid, strong base problem. Barium sulfate and sulfuric acid. Hang on, folks, I can't hear. How's that? Is that better? I just wrote it up there quickly. I have to go check and see if that's a reasonable one. Emily? That's a great question. The question that's being asked is, we solved for x in the last problem, why would we care about it? What if I want to know what the cadmium ion concentration is at equilibrium? Then I need to know x, right? What, are you guys throwing things at each other still? Emma? Oh.
Settle down here, folks. Trying to get too creative. Start with 80 millimoles of sodium iodide and 4 millimoles of cadmium nitrate in 100 milliliters of solution, and it'll let you do that. Why did I say sodium iodide? Because I don't care about sodium. Group 1 compounds are soluble. Why did I say cadmium nitrate? Because all nitrates are soluble. I don't care about nitrate. All right, let me, let me finish one thing before I go on to another. Let's not mix metaphors here. All right, this problem. Um, earlier in the year, did you show us how sometimes you mentioned in the quiz you want to break it down into different steps and break it down into different steps? Yeah. Okay. A couple questions about this one. It started out by saying, would you ever have us calculate the pH? Yes, I would. If I were to tell you you have some aluminum hydroxide, calculate the pH of the solution, this hexavalent aluminum ion, when you put it into water, is going to give you some hydroxide ions. And so if I can figure out the concentration of hydroxide ions at equilibrium, I can then calculate the pH. Or an even better way to do it would be, what if I buffer this system at a pH of 12? Now, what is the solubility of aluminum hydroxide? It's just an equilibrium problem, okay? Let me start with an initial concentration. So, it's an equilibrium problem. I need an initial concentration. And here comes the, there is going to be a slight twist on this one. If I just had aluminum hydroxide, I have three molar. None of that, none of that. I'm just looking at the aluminum hydroxide. I'm not looking at the buffer yet. Okay? The change that occurs so at equilibrium I have this. The K for this reaction is that. If we substitute in what we know, This is if it was in water solution. Now we say, wait a second, it's not in water solution, it's in a pH 12 buffer. Well, if it's in a pH 12 buffer, then this is 10 to the minus 2. Why? If it's pH 12, it's pOH is 2. If it's pOH is 2, its concentration is 10 to the minus 2. So there is some hydroxide ion to start, 
And because it's a buffer, and this is where it helps to understand what a buffer is, that's 10 to the minus 2. A buffer is a system that resists changes in pH upon addition of acid or base. Well, guess what? This is a Lewis base. Excuse me. And so the, PA, the hydroxide ion concentration is still going to be 10 to the minus 2 when this reaches equilibrium because the buffer is going to force it to be that. That's what the buffer does. The rest of it I still have to solve, but that means I don't have this here anymore. I have this now. I still need a value for K, right? Because I still have two unknowns. I don't know X and I don't know K. So this is where you'll look at your data table that yes, you would have a data table. And in our book, we look this up and we say, I hope we have this one in here. Ah, uh, yes. Nope, that's the side, that's that one. It ends up I don't have this one, so I'm going to make up a value. I'm sorry? We're solving for solubility, which brings up a good question. Is KSP the same as solubility? No. KSP is the equilibrium constant for a solubility product expression. Solubility is how much dissolves. The solubility of something is how much of it dissolves. KSP is the product that results for an equilibrium. So if the value of this reaction is, and I'd have to give this to you, four times 10 to the minus 24, you could solve this one. And it's actually a piece of cake this time. Why? This is such a small number. What can you tell me about x? It's non-existent. So then I can solve this and say x is equal to 12 times 10 to the minus 24 divided by this to the sixth. Oh, I did that too fast, didn't I? Did I go the wrong way again? At least I'm consistent, right? That's why somebody always checks my answer key. <coughs> the question is, will I tell you if it's all aqueous? If you see an ion, you will assume it's aqueous. Okay? We have not, nothing in non-aqueous solvents. I'm sorry? I would tell you if it's a solid. Yes. No, an ion is never a solid. You can't have a charged ion. That's sodium triiodide. Well, let me answer this question before I get these two. The question here was, earlier in the semester we said, sometimes when you did this it was a multi-step process. When you're talking about the kinetics of it, yes it is. But we're not talking about the kinetics. We're just going all the way to equilibrium, so we don't have to worry about if there may indeed be a multi-step process there. We also talked about it in terms of polyprotic acids. Again, we're not going to worry about that for this, okay? Is it, well, you tell me, which K is it? Are we forming a complex ion in that reaction? So it's not a KF. Are we dissolving a solid? Nope, so it's not a KSP. Is H3O plus a product? Nope, so it's not a KA. What kind of K is it? It's a KB. The question is, is if I asked you the pH of this reaction, how would you do it? I haven't a clue. Actually, there's a way to do it, but
The question now is, what's the difference between, in terms of KSPs, molar solubility and molarity? When you talk about solubility, so for example, silver chloride, This is a KSP, right? This is a solid breaking apart into its ions. I don't know that that's the value. I don't think it is. I think it's 10 to the minus 10. I know silver chloride is not very soluble. It breaks apart into silver ions and chloride. The question will be asked, what is the solubility of silver chloride? They're asking how much silver chloride will dissolve when you put it in water? You can give your answer in whatever units make sense for an amount. I can dissolve 18 grams in 85 liters of water. I can dissolve one mole in three liters of water. So molar solubility is how many moles will dissolve when you put it in the water. And the units you put on it are not too critical. So molarity is just a unit. Molar solubility is how much dissolves. Okay? We're going to finish up. Don't forget what rooms you were in the last time. Go to the same rooms as the last test. I'll be online tonight if you have questions, and I'm in my office for a little while now. Baseball players should come see me.